Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase, every day. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. Hey there, Hang Up listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI. And stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. The following podcast contains explicit language. Hide your children. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of March 4th, 2024. On this week's show, the NFL journalism legend Peter King will join us to talk about Justin Fields, Caleb Williams, and the Chicago Bears' QB dilemma, plus what we learned from the NFL Combine, if anyone ever learns anything from the NFL Combine. And then, after we put Peter through the paces, we will interrogate him about why he is retiring, what he's proudest of in his long career, and what he maybe got wrong. I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm the author of the book, The Queen, and the host of an upcoming slow burn season on the rise of Fox News and how the left tried to fight back. Also in D.C. is Stefan Fatsis. He's the author of the books Word Freak, A Few Seconds of Panic, and Wild and Outside. Stefan, at an airport gift shop, I saw a coaster with the word wine spelled out in Scrabble tiles. Don't worry, I ordered you a hundred of this. Thought you'd like it. Thanks. Yeah, I don't have any Scrabble coasters, so that that would be great. Yeah, thanks. Where was that airport gift shop, Josh? I went to Detroit. I'll say more about that when the time comes, but uh, okay. I had a nice time in Detroit. Detroit nice. Tourism Board. Sponsor, hang up and listen. Did you go to Windsor? Did not make it to Canada. I looked at it oh. across the Detroit River, Oops. though. Nice skyline over there, huh? You got to drive south from Detroit. That's what they tell you repeatedly. <laughs> they do tell you that a lot. With us, as always, from Palo Alto, it's Joel Anderson who, among many things, writes Slate's emotional investment column. Joel, I ordered you 100 coasters with the word Monster Zero spelled out in uh, football football helmet (laughs) logos. (laughs) Great. I love that. My name, not so much. Uh, (laughs) What is your Monster Zero intake these days? So I've uh, increased it back to one per day. During slow burn... It's about four per day. <laughs> oh, God. No, literally. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. You need, that you up. need those coasters badly. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Well, there's an argument that I probably don't, along <laughs> with not needing the monsters themselves. Um, I'm, I'm telling myself this is just a temporary relapse, and that I'm, I'm not going to be doing this long term. All right. So a bunch of sponsorship opportunities here: Monster, City of Detroit, Wine, <laughs> Canada, <laughs> Hasbro. Come on, Stefan. How come that's never happened for us? We want to thank our Slate Plus members for supporting us, for making this show possible. And uh, we've got a bonus segment for you. Before we've even had a 12-team college football playoff, we're already talking about the 14-team playoff. Let's uh, get into it in our bonus segment. Is it good? Is it bad? Indifferent? If you want to hear what we think and you want to hear bonus segments on other Slate shows, get ad-free listening for all Slate podcasts and support us you need to be a Slate Plus member. To sign up, go to slate.com slash hangup plus. That's slate.com slash hangup plus. NFL reporter, columnist, and commentator Peter King announced last week that he is retiring. I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth, King wrote in his weekly column for NBC Sports, Football Morning in America. To be a long-termer in an increasingly short-term business, to write this column for 27 years, and to be a sports writer for 44, well, that's something I'll always be grateful for. Truly, I've loved it all. King's farewell column ran to more than 12,000 words, which was only slightly longer than usual. He started writing the column, originally titled Monday Morning Quarterback, for Sports Illustrated in 1997. Let's conservatively say that he wrote 300,000 words a year, 
around three books worth. Multiply that by 27 years, you get around 8 million words or 80 books. And that doesn't count the 17 years of King's career before the column, most of them at SI. Peter King is with us now. Congratulations on a staggering run, Peter. And thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks a lot for having me, Stefan. I mean, I listen to those words. I hear what you're saying. And I say to myself, how did all that happen? And I think it all happened because it never really felt like work. It always felt like what I was meant to do. So thanks a lot for the nice intro. You're welcome, Peter. Before we get, we want to talk some NFL, Caleb Williams, Justin Fields, Combine. But before we get into that and into your career, I wanted to first say how sorry we are about your longtime NFL colleague, Chris Mortensen of ESPN, who died over the weekend at 72. He'd been diagnosed with throat cancer back in 2016. You tweeted on Sunday, a giant in our business and a terrific person will miss you, Mort. Yeah, I mean, I live in Brooklyn. I'm not there at this moment, but I live in Brooklyn. I was walking my dog and uh, I looked down at my phone and it said, Mort. And uh, so I picked it up and he was very gracious, very nice. And, you know, he sounded really good compared to a few of the times that I've talked to him in recent years. I mean, really, he was diagnosed with stage four throat cancer and it metastasized in his lungs and i don't know exactly what the cause of death was but i have talked to him when he hasn't sounded very good over the last few years but last week he sounded really good which is why the news came as a shock to a lot of people and certainly came as a shock to me but um you know i'm Fortunate I was able to know Chris Mortensen for a long time. I met him covering baseball in the 80s when I was working in Cincinnati, and he was covering uh, the Atlanta Braves. And so I've known him for a long time, and he's really been a terrific human being and uh, learned a lot from him over the years, especially learned a lot about how to cover any sport, how to cover anything the right way. So, um, it's a low point in our business, but I think it'll be a high point if we all remember the good things about the guy. Thank you for that uh, remembrance, Peter. And we wanted to talk to you about, we want to put you to, to work one last time here before you go off into retirement. Um, the story of um, the offseason in the NFL is what the Chicago Bears are going to do with their quarterback situation. They've got Justin Fields. They have the number one pick. And reports, rumors are that they're going to trade Fields and draft Caleb Williams. So first of all, is that what you're hearing? And do you think that that's the right move for the Bears? I'll be honest with you. I did not go to the scouting combine this year. I realized very late in this season that I was going to be retiring. And so there was really no sense in me to invest time in the draft when I wasn't going to be writing about it. It was one year ago this week that I sat in a hotel suite with Ryan Poles, the general manager of the uh, of the Chicago Bears. And I remember it was about maybe a week or so before he ended up trading the first pick in the draft to Carolina. And the thing I remember about Ryan Poles from that meeting we had that day is that, and when I say this, it's going to sound a little ridiculous, but I remember about that day that Ryan Poles was unafraid. You know, that may sound odd, but there is a certain amount of fear, I think, when you have a flagship NFL franchise in your hands and you are doing what you believe is the best thing for the franchise and there are going to be 15 million people who are going to have a very strong opinion on it one way or the other and he knew that he understood that and he basically had no problem with taking that responsibility on 
but it's not an easy responsibility to have. And so I look at this right now and I see the handwriting on the wall and the handwriting on the wall seems to me to say that Ryan Poles has had plenty of opportunity to make a definitive statement that Justin Fields is our guy. And we are going forward with Justin Fields, and I am auctioning off the first pick in the draft. He hasn't said that. So I'm like everybody else. I have not talked to Ryan Poles, but I'm probably like everybody else. And, you know, what you just said in in your question, which is that it seems to me most logical that they're going to take a quarterback, number one, I'm assuming it's going to be Caleb Williams, and they'll trade Justin Fields for the best offer that they can get. Peter, you mentioned that you didn't go to the Combine this year, and I was listening to the Peter King podcast where you talked a little bit about the decision process that went into you know your retirement. And you said on there that one of the things that came to mind is that you just didn't want to go to the combine again. Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit, about how you how you came to that realization and how you felt when you realized you felt that way? There's a lot of things that six and eight and 10 years ago I was dying to do that I love to do. And for years, I love going to the scouting combine because, you know, I would start off, I'd build a little grid for the days that I'd be there and I would set up my appointments and my late night beers uh, or a glass of wine with with a general manager, a coach, personnel guy, whatever. And I got to the point the last couple of years that every time when I would leave the combine, I'd be just physically exhausted. One year I was sick coming home from the combine. And it isn't that I don't like it, but it's just that I kind of have gotten used to going to bed at 9.30 at night. And... I can take not doing it for a day or two, but when I do it for a week, it just sort of throws me off. I just don't like doing it anymore. And so you realize, well, then the combine is probably not the best place for you to go because you're out till one o'clock most nights and you're drinking too much and you're eating too much and and all that. Peter, you would file your column at 2.30 a.m. every week. (laughs) But that was one night. That was one night. That wasn't five nights in a row. Look, I'm not saying that I'm a far different person at age 66 than I was at 61 or 60, but it just became something that I really didn't want to do anymore. One of the things I'm really looking forward to not doing is a mock draft because that became an insane exercise. There were just some things that I know it's going to sound you know, silly, but look, I threw myself into my job for a long time, for most of 44 years. And you know that it's time when there are things about it, specific things that you absolutely don't want to do anymore. And when those, when there are enough of those things, it's just time to go. You were a good enough soldier, though, Peter, over all those years that, look, you had the ability to tell a boss, you know, mock draft, why don't we get someone else to do that? But you see, you couldn't, you can't do that. You can't do that. If you were going to do my job, mock drafts, it it has become a really big part of this business. And I think if I didn't do it after years and years of doing it, that to me says, well, maybe you shouldn't be doing this job at all. And and again, of course, I could have said I don't want to do it. And nobody at NBC would have said, oh, what a baby he is or what, the, you know, <laughs> they would have said, OK, it's fine. But that mock draft column in the last three or four years was it, that got probably 40 or 50 percent more traffic than my Super Bowl column. And so, you know, where I'm I'm sitting in a room alone with Andy Reid and he's telling me how Tom and Jerry, the winning play in the Super Bowl, exactly how it worked. And so, you know, I, I mean, it's one thing to say, 
okay, I'm taking off four weeks in the summer. But if you're going to tell your people at NBC that something that is going to get six million impressions and however many page views in this business these days, and you're just simply not going to do it, I, I don't know. I just It's not anything that I would ever think of saying. If you're going to do the job, got to do a mock draft. So one thing that's changed, um, and tell me if this is right, but my sense is that's changed a lot in the last, you know, several decades that you've been working on this is the shift in the NFL to being a year-round sport and to everything being eventized. The schedule release, the the draft, the mock draft season, the combine. And I get the sense from what you just said that you were happiest covering the games, the people who played the games and coached the games. Is there a part of you that like wished that people cared more about the actual games and didn't care as much about the free agent speculation and trade speculation and draft speculation? I don't mind anything really about the NFL from, let's just say, training camps opening on or about July 20th to the draft on or about April 30th. You know what I really don't like and I haven't liked for years? I haven't liked May, June, and two-thirds of July. I haven't liked that 11-week period. You know why? Because all we're writing is crap and pablum, mostly. I shouldn't say all. Most of what we're writing is filler. I ran this site at Sports Illustrated called the MMQB for five years, and originally, I wanted, we we only had a staff in terms of writers of, of five. And so how are we all going to be able to do this job, be really competitive during the season? How would we all find time to take some vacation at the end of the year? And there were two years in a row where I remember I would be on vacation and I would just say to my wife, my family, whoever we were with, that particular year, I need 45 minutes each morning because I had to help keep the site going. It's idiotic. It's ridiculous. It's not very humane, quite honestly. And I just think that the NFL over the years has gotten buy-in from all people in the media that we're never going to turn the lights off. I just don't like it. I don't like it at all. It's, you know, there should be a time where you put it away. There should be, you know, one fifth of the year that you don't worry about football, you don't care about football, that you watch, you know, whatever, cornhole. I don't care. (laughs) You covered a lot that I want to go back to. And obviously we want to go back to the earlier part of your career too. But you did mention the mock draft and how it's a big part of the business. And you really, like as a as a writer and having, you know, followed your career for so long, you really did always seem to have a grasp for what readers wanted. And I think the MMQB column was like a, a real big sign of that. That You know, you seemed to know that there was an appetite for people. They just wanted some of the nuggets that you got from your reporting over the years. So can you just talk a little bit about what made you want to start writing for the internet? Because at the time that you did it, like there still was a lot of skepticism about the internet and what it might mean if there was an audience there. So how did you know to do that and what made you want to do it? Honestly, the only reason I did it is that my pro football editor at Sports Illustrated, a guy I liked a lot named Steve Robinson, was given this job running this new website called CNNSI.com. And this was, now it was 27 years ago when he's given this job. And at the time, most people at Sports Illustrated, when Steve asked them, They either said no or they say, hey, just put in what I wrote for the magazine. You know, I'm not writing anything extra special. And I felt for Steve a little bit. But I also have always thought that there's no law that says stories have to be told one way forever. And I was into new technology, new things, new ways to tell stories. So I said, I'll give this a try and we'll see what happens. And look, I probably told a few too many in the first five, six, seven years personal stories. I 
I wrote one entire column about a 13 inning softball game that my daughter pitched and won. And I don't know, I sometimes I probably got away with things just because it was my column and nobody would tell me what to do. But I don't know. I, I really thought that the internet was a good crossover piece for me because at the time, you got to remember what Sports Illustrated was at the time. Other than Rick Riley writing the back page and maybe two or three other writers there, we were basically told only the facts, ma'am. You know, tell us what happened. No opinions. Just tell us what happened in the game and tell us why and describe things. And, you know, don't put yourself in the middle of the story necessarily. So I basically, you know, took to it and I really enjoyed it. And I like giving my opinion on things. And over the years, it has caused me to be a, probably a punching bag a lot and a lot more than most people in the media, but you know, whatever. I mean, like for instance, I would, after our hall of fame meetings, when we would have elections for the pro football hall of fame. Now what happens, you know, the, the, the exact things that are said inside the meeting, we're not allowed to share those, but I always felt like, okay, if I'm going to be on this committee, I'm going to explain who I voted for, who I didn't vote for, and why. Doing things like that and trying as best I, as I could to try to take people behind the curtain, those are the things that over the years that I've enjoyed doing because I think that I think people should know about things like the Hall of Fame. I mean, why is this guy in and why is this guy not in? And And so I... I think the public has a right to know those things. And I've kind of enjoyed sharing those as much as I could. Peter, you mentioned that you've been a punching bag over the years for readers and critics and others. You were very kind to me when I wrote A Few Seconds of Panic. The first time I met you was at Broncos. That's because it was a great, it was a fantastic book. Oh, thank you, Peter. That's really, really? kind. I mean, yeah. and then I met you at training camp and I remember, you know, I knew of you and I may have spoken with you once or twice before that. But watching you work the players, I mean, it was really like the respect that everyone had for you there was kind of amazing. You had your schedule. You sat at this picnic table outside the outside the headquarters and you did your interviews right there with players. And it was really kind of really fascinating to watch, especially given the disdain that a lot of players had for the media and have for the media. You mentioned the punching bag thing. A few years later, I repaid your kindness by being the puncher. I wrote a piece in Slate criticizing your coverage of Michael Sam's announcement that he was gay. Um, I wasn't alone. Some of your SI colleagues also were taken to task for granting anonymity to a lot of NFL scouts and coaches and executives who trashed Sam's ability and the likelihood that an NFL team would welcome a gay player. I'm wondering how you look back at stories like those and over, over the course of your career, you know, and in the end, Sam didn't play in the NFL and we don't know whether he was a casualty of homophobia or he just wasn't good enough. Do you have any regrets about that coverage? And is that a story that stands out in uh, your ledger of, of stories? The Michael Sam story was complicated for a lot of football reasons, as well as just a lot of reasons, period. But the one thing I do remember about that, that was kind of in the early days of the MMQB. And I remember we had a writer at the MMQB at the time named Greg Bedard. And I asked Greg, I want you to go find as many Missouri football games from this past year when he had an excellent year. I want you to write a story about exactly the kind of football player Michael Sam is. I don't want you to write the story with any adjectives that would be viewed as either positive or negative. I want you to simply write, here is what I think of Michael Sam as a football player from tape that I watched. And I remember I didn't edit a lot of stories, but I edited that one and I tried to take out anything in the story that could be in any way perceived as showing a positive or negative slant on it. I simply wanted to know what Greg, who was wrote intelligently, 
talking about football, what he thought when he saw that. And look, there were problems, I think, once he got to the Rams in how in what exactly happened when when he got to the Rams, because, look, it's never been confirmed. It's never been said what exactly the Rams did. But a lot of people think and I can't tell you whether this is true or not, that the Rams, unless they got a call from somebody at the league office or from the commissioner, would not have drafted him and would have drafted a player named Ethan Westbrooks as their seventh round pick. They ended up signing Ethan Westbrook in free agency. And he ended up, he didn't have a great career, but he ended up having a better career than Michael Sam did. And look, all I know is at the time, I tried to be fair. I tried to be a journalist about it. Uh, I forget if I, and if I did use inflammatory words on either side of it, that was a mistake. But I do think that a lot of these stories become stories that in real time, you try to do the best job you can. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you fail. And I have had my share of failures. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with more from Peter King. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. Earn up to 3% daily cash back on every purchase, every day. Then, grow it at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account with Apple Card. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, as our company expands, so do our hiring efforts. How can AI help us attract top talent? Signed, Searching for Higher Power. So, Searching for Higher Power, one of the most daunting undertakings of an HR leader today is building a new team and finding and vetting new talent. This is a very time-consuming process and can take precious organizational resources. As a companion to the HR team, AI technology can be used to create job descriptions, analyze candidate resumes, and filter candidates into various pools based on experience, skills, or any other parameter. You can also use AI to match internal talent with positions available. Parameters for this can be set, rules can be set, that can all be done through the algorithm. There are so many things that we as humans could be not looking at that AI can do in a matter of seconds. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try, and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies, all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the more than 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. 
a quick warning that this segment contains a reference to suicide. I want to tell a quick Peter King story. I don't know if you remember this, Peter, but we were in the same fantasy league, baseball league together through Baseball Prospectus. Um, And these are like some of the smartest, most analytical baseball people in the entire universe. And then there's me and Peter King, who are probably not in that (laughs) same category. But I remember I took this like pretty seriously and I was co-managing the team with my friend Steven. Shout out Steven Ehrenberg. And I emailed you and I was like, hey, would you like to do this trade? I'm going to, I don't remember who the players were, but I do remember what you said back, which was, hey, Josh, I'm so busy right now, you know, with NFL stuff. If you think that's a good trade for me, I'll go ahead and do it. Just let me know. You like gave me like a dark night of my soul. And I wrote you back. I was like, actually, you know what? If I were you, I wouldn't do that. You you softened you softened my heart, Peter King. I did not take advantage of you. Well, I'll just just say this. In the intervening years, I've become a first class jerk as a fantasy, (laughs) as a fantasy baseball player, because I drive a hard bargain. And I'm not really very nice. And if I, I remember last year um, making a trade for Ozzy Albies at the trade <laughs> deadline in our league, and there was a guy who desperately needed pitching, and he offered me everything <laughs> other than Ozzy Albies. And I said, "Look, I'll give you my best two pitchers right now if you give me Ozzy Albies." And so we we ended up doing it. Uh, and he was like forever bitter about it that I wouldn't take anything else. And I said, look, I didn't hold a gun to your head. The only way I would make this trade is if it was for Albies. So I don't know. I've become a little bit, probably a little bit more hardened when it comes to uh, making trades in baseball. So what you're saying is that your your nice guy persona, Peter, is just an act. You're actually a, you're actually a it's hard It's a total ass. pile of crap. Yeah. It's yeah. a total pile of crap. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask about um, the NFL and concussions and CTE. That's been a, a huge story that's played out over your 40 years covering the league. And yeah. I think, you know, as a fan and then as somebody covering it, I was blind to it for a long time. And um, I was wondering, again, kind of in the same vein that Stefan was asking about Michael Same, looking back at your coverage, do you feel, do you have any regrets about how you wrote about? head injuries, or maybe didn't write about head injuries and and concussions at a time when, you know, maybe Sports Illustrated could have had some influence. I don't know. I think I, that, that is one of the things that when I look back at my time, I didn't write enough about CTE. I didn't write enough about head trauma. I definitely could have done more as somebody who was, you know, at least at my level, a bit of an influential person. And I think the job that Ann McKee is doing in basically examining the brains of deceased former football players, the job that Chris Nowinski is doing at the Concussion Legacy Institute, they're doing a fantastic job. And they're doing work that really needs to be done. And I remember in 2010, when it was really reaching critical mass, there was a time when James Harrison was really known as the headhunter and the NFL started fining him huge amounts, $150,000, $175,000. And, and I remember players at the time were just killing the NFL at the time for doing this, even though what the NFL was attempting to begin to try to do was to take care of players on the field better and protect them from some of these really egregious helmet to helmet hits, particularly. And I remember Kevin Mawai, who was the president of the NFLPA at the time in the middle of 2010 saying the people at the NFL office should take their skirts off. I mean, how far we've come really. I mean, it was just, I think in the next three years, both Dave Dewerson and Junior Seau killed themselves with gunshots to the chest in both cases so that their brains could be studied for the damaging effects uh, of head trauma. And both of them were found to have significant evidence of CTE in the brain. And so, 
yes, as I look back on it now, that was a cover story back in 2010. We wrote a lot about it back then. But over the years, I probably should have done more. You know, Peter, going back to January when Sports Illustrated had all those layoffs and it's going through whatever the hell it's going through, you at the time said, look, the bottom line in this is that there isn't a Sports Illustrated now. It doesn't exist. Now, obviously, you worked there for a long time and you were one of the faces of that, of that news organization while you were there. What has the loss of the Sports Illustrated that you were a part of meant for the journalism industry, you think? Um, because, I mean, I, as a kid, like, I mean, I was, you know, that was one of the first things I can vividly remember, like getting those magazine covers at home and storing them up and reading all the writers there. And that, that's just not there anymore. So you've had some time to think about that. So what have we lost with sort of the, the degradation of that brand? Well, just think about, you know, when I started at SI in 1989, um, the first five, six, seven years, Sports Illustrated was bigger than ESPN. It seems ridiculous to think that anything could be bigger than ESPN, but Sports Illustrated was bigger than ESPN. I remember distinctly going to cover a Dallas Cowboys game, I think 91, might have been 90, and going over to talk to Michael Irvin, and Michael Irvin said, hey, Peter, and he, and he shouted out in the locker room, hey, guys, we're in a Sports Illustrated game this week, man. And when those things go away, my biggest issue with sort of the, however you describe it, with the influence of Sports Illustrated waning, my biggest problem is very, very simple in that nothing really has replaced it. There are very, very few things very, very few news organizations with no ties to anybody in the NFL that are really influential. And what I mean is that ESPN has a contract with the NFL. My company, NBC, has a contract with the NFL. Every, you know, Fox and CBS and Amazon Prime Video. And so all these places. So what was the one huge news organization and hugely influential thing that landed on in the mailbox of 3.2 million homes every Thursday afternoon, what has replaced that? Nothing. And now you have just an increasing amount in the media of people who used to work for newspapers and other sort of mainstream publications who are now working for NFL.com or NFL Media, and Roger Goodell is signing their paycheck. Peter, the arc of your career has seen the NFL grow exponentially to become an 18 to $20 billion business every year. When you look back to when you started, what would you say are the most significant changes in the league and its social presence since the late 80s? I would say the fact that it's become a year-round venture that – they have figured out that people love the NFL so much that they have made tent pole events out of things that we would normally just laugh at. We used to cover the living heck out of the draft every year, but now it is covering the combine. You know, when I went to the scouting combine in 2000, there were about 20 credentialed media members. I didn't go this year, but last year, there were 1,241. So, you know, they've made a gigantic event out of the combine. They made a huge event out of the beginning of free agency, the NF and obviously the draft. And then they have made a return of football event out of the first weekend that every team is in training camp. So that there are live shots on NFL Network and on ESPN from almost every training camp throughout an entire weekend. They've just figured out that the appetite for NFL stuff is just voracious. I think that's one thing. I think the second thing that has happened is that in some ways, whatever you might say about the NFL, the one thing that I think is really important to realize is that the 32 franchises in the NFL are owned by insanely wealthy men. And what do insanely wealthy men do? 
they try to become more insanely wealthy. And so they've done things like increase the presence of international uh, games and their presence internationally now. And I happen to think that international football is fantastic. I love it. It's one of the things about the NFL that I think they've really done right. I got in this argument with Chris Russo on his show one day. Uh, They should just play the games in the U.S. The Premier League doesn't export games. The NFL shouldn't either. And I said, hey, Chris, who gives a crap if the Jacksonville Atlanta game in the middle of October is played at 930 in the morning on national TV or is the fourth game for CBS in the one o'clock early window of games? Who cares? Why do you care? It doesn't matter. And in some ways, it's better because it gives another national telecast for people who are nutty football fans. That plus the fact that all over the world, when I did my farewell column and then I invited email, you know, hey, I'm going to write an email column as my last column uh, for Football Morning in America. I got email from 23 countries. I mean, people around this planet love the NFL. Maybe not everybody, but enough people love the NFL that the NFL gets great television ratings on Sunday in Germany and in many countries in in Europe. It's starting to get huge in South America now. The NFL eventually is going to play a game in Australia. So anyway, I'm just simply saying that that has been a positive. But the final thing I would say is that the NFL had better be careful about its its uh, ties with gambling companies. I just think that in five, six, eight years from now, we are going to hear tragic stories of people who've lost everything because of these incredible come-ons from, hey, listen, you place your first bet, we'll put $200 in your account that you you can use to bet with. I mean, tell me something to kids in high school and college, and don't tell me kids in high school haven't figured out how to get accounts because they have. I think that is really potentially dangerous. If you ask me what on the horizon would worry you about football, that would worry me a lot. Last thing from me, Peter, is that at the end of every show, I say remember Zelmo Beatty, who is the basketball legend um, that people who growing up now have never heard of. And to understand the story of basketball in America, you need to know who Zelmo Beatty is. And so if we were to say, remember someone who played in the NFL, somebody maybe you haven't thought about in a couple of years, somebody who kids growing up uh, in Australia who are going to get an NFL game in a few years have never heard of, who would you want people to to know and remember give me a name that's that's absolutely simple remember otto graham otto graham entered professional football in 1946 he was signed by paul brown to play for the cleveland browns and he played in the all america football conference for four years and then in the national football league for six in every one of those 10 years Otto Graham led the Cleveland Browns to the championship game of his sport. The Browns won seven championships in Otto Graham's 10 years. He led the his league in passing four times in those 10 years. He should go down, in my opinion, as one of the best three quarterbacks ever to play. But most people believe that football history – begins in either 1960 or 1970. So the vast majority of people have no no idea about Otto Graham. And that's sad to me. Baseball reveres its history. They revere Babe Ruth and uh, so many of the great heroes of yesterday. And the NFL doesn't do a good enough job in revering the people who in the first 40 years of the sport made it a sport so that by 1958, the Giants Colts championship game became one of the greatest games in the history of the league. And 
was t- one of the first games to ever be televised nationally. So I just think that people in the NFL should revere its history a little bit more. So we've asked you a lot about the stories you've got to cover, the people you've got to talk to, but I know as a reporter that there's got to be somebody out there, the great white well that you never were able to quite reel in here, the person, a story that you wanted to do, and for whatever reason, the person wouldn't talk to you or the story did not come together. What is that person? What is that story? This is going to sound really weird because it sounds totally cocky and it makes me sound like a like a jerk, but I don't really have one because over the years, here's how I felt about stories. If somebody wouldn't talk to me, that presented a challenge to me that I loved because then my job was going to be to tell the story better by not talking to someone than had I been able to spend four hours with that person. So I don't have one. I never, there are a lot of people who wouldn't talk to me. I mean, look, I haven't talked to Bill Belichick in, what is it now? Seven, I haven't talked to him in 17 years. Wow. Really? He disagreed with some of my coverage on Spygate. And my belief then, my belief now is that Bill Belichick knew the rules. He's not a dummy. He knew that he shouldn't have one of his guys videotaping the signals on the sidelines of another team during their game. And yet he did it. And he deserves everything that comes of it. And that, look, I have no idea what his New York Times obituary is going to say. But Spygate, not necessarily Deflategate, Spygate needs to be in the first three or four paragraphs of that obit, no matter how many games he wins. That's just not, that's not what you do. And I think defenders of Belichick will always say, because they've said it to me a hundred times, oh, everybody was doing it. Reminds me of if you're on I-95 at two o'clock in the morning and and you're driving 83 miles an hour in the middle of nowhere, New Jersey, and five cars pass you and, and they're going a hundred and you get pulled over and you say, hey, listen, those five guys who just passed me, they had to be going 100. Why just stop me? I said, well, because you were going, I clocked you at 87 miles an hour. I don't care about the other ones. I got you. And that's the same thing with the Patriots. I don't care who else was doing it. Show me proof that other people were doing it. Bring that to the fore. Otherwise, just take your punishment and move on and I don't know. I don't have a lot of sympathy for Patriot supporters and or Bill Belichick when when it comes to uh, Spygate. I'm happy to end with uh, Peter King dissing the Patriots. Peter King, you're a first ballot football Hall of Fame journalist and genuinely one of the good guys. We'll post a link to Peter's farewell column on our show page. It's titled, It's Time, Who's Complaining, Not Me. And it ends with a haiku that ends with a little journalese. It's been rewarding. The future, I do not know. But for now, 30. Peter, congratulations again. Thanks for your work and for coming on this show. Great to be on with you guys. Thanks a lot for asking me to come on. Don't trade with them in your fantasy baseball league. (laughs) I'm a killer. I'm a barracuda. (laughs) If you or someone you know is experiencing thoughts of self-harm or suicide, please reach out to the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988 for immediate support and assistance. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. 
Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. And automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology. Real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Now it's time for Afterball, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. Thank you again to uh, the legend Peter King. And in his final column, there are a bunch of finals in the final column, but the final coffee nerdness needs to be you know, documented, remembered. I'm going to read it in full. I was in Ithaca, New York Saturday, fortunate enough to find Hound and Mare, a coffee shop downtown, first because of the whole refuge thing on a 14-degree morning, second because of the New York maple latte. Mainline that into my veins, please. Fantastic drink, lovely atmosphere. My veins are totally fine without a New York maple latte. I was still quoting from Peter King. Stefan, what is your New York maple latte? Another year, another season in which my public high school boys basketball team didn't win the D.C. state championship. This time, the Jackson Reed Tigers fell short in the semifinals of the D.C. Class AA tournament, losing to private school powerhouse St. John's College High School 55-52 to at Georgetown on Friday. Jackson Reed is my neighborhood school. It's got more than 2,000 students from across the city and is about 40% white, 30% black black, 20 plus percent Latino. My daughter went there when it was known as Woodrow Wilson High School before the segregationist ex-president was booted and the school renamed for its first black teacher and first black principal. It has a couple of small gyms, one turf field that multiple sports share. The baseball team plays in a federal park across the street. The locker and weight rooms are not great. The school just added some trailers in the parking lot to handle crowding. St. John's, by contrast, sits on a sprawling 30-acre campus with three multi-sport fields plus a turf baseball field. It's got a 2,000-square-foot weight room, a full-size collegiate basketball court, wrestling rooms, plural, classrooms for reviewing game film, a sports medicine facility, and an indoor golf simulator. In 2015, Under Armour found and St. John's alum, Kevin Plank, donated $16 million to fund a second phase of the school's master plan to make improvements on campus, including state-of-the-art athletics facilities. The school's new president was previously the chief strategy officer at Under Armour. Order your $136 Under Armour Ladies Atlas Insulated Jacket from the school website now. Anyway, sports are important to St. John's the way air and water are important to life on Earth. St. John's plays in one of the strongest high school conferences in the country. It recruits and spends like crazy in pursuit of local and occasionally national prominence. Recent St. John's athletes include UConn basketball star AZ Fudd and Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receiver Rakeem Jarrett. D.C. also includes national prep sports powers Gonzaga, Caleb Williams' alma mater, and Sidwell Friends, Sadiq Bay of the Atlanta Hawks, Josh Hart of the New York Knicks, Kiki Rice of UCLA. And yet, Jackson Reed has made the D.C. boys basketball final the last five seasons. It beat St. John's in 2018 before losing to Sidwell in 2019, Gonzaga in 2020, and Sidwell again in 2022 and 23. Listeners might recall that we attended and discussed some crazy, heartbreaking buzzer beater defeats. Sidwell won a third straight boys title on Sunday, beating St. John's 47 to 37. In a girls tournament upset, St. John's stopped Sidwell from winning its third straight championship 42 to 39. 
Jackson Reed is three times the size of any other public high school in D.C., which helps explain why the Tigers lose to other publics only in rare flukes. It's not quite its baseball team's 30-year run without a loss in D.C. league play, but here are some of the boys' scores against fellow D.C. public schools this season. 70-18, 68-31, 75-31, 88-31, 70 to 18, 68 to 31, 75 to 31, 88 to 22, 66 to 18, 81 to 17, 81 to 25, 71 to 18, 64 to 21, 73 to 28, and in the quarterfinals of the DC State Tournament, as it's called, 61 to 13. Thanks to these walkovers, Jackson Reed went 33-3 and and outscored its opponents by more than 1,000 points. So the focus for Jackson Reed is competing with the private schools. And in basketball, the only way to do that is to recruit two. This year, the Tigers brought in four players from local prep powerhouses, St. John's, Gonzaga, DeMatha, and St. Andrews. And that's not unusual. Have all of these players lived within Jackson Reed's boundaries as required by city rules? I don't know, but there are always whispers. The Tigers' schedule this year included a bunch of for-profit tournaments, one of them in Georgia. As our friend Dave McKenna of Defector, who follows D.C. school sports closer than Peter King followed the NFL, told me over the weekend, that's not a public school program, that's an AAU team. But ends say hello to means. Jackson Reed was ranked in the top 25 in the nation by both ESPN and Max Preps. A documentary crew followed the team around all season. They made another run to D.C. glory and fell just short. I root for the Tigers to beat the privates every year because of the disparities in money, resources, facilities, and privilege. I was cheering hard at the St. John's game. Jackson Reed came back from 15 down, but not all the way. But I also wonder how this is worth it. Is a school with a built-in size advantage that also bulks up its roster and blows out almost every other public school good for high school sports in a city? Students don't even show up until the playoffs because regular season games are a joke. Should a public school be hopscotching the country, playing a grueling schedule? Is it fair to JV players who attended the feeder middle schools only to get cut from the varsity because the coach recruited a few ringers? Sure, that's high school basketball everywhere, and other D.C. public schools recruit, too, in part to try to compete with Jackson Reed. And hopefully some of the Tigers' best players will get college scholarships, like 2022 grad Darren Buchanan, who was not a transfer and is starting and averaging almost 16 points a game at George Washington here in D.C., And hopefully some of the Tigers' best players will get college scholarships, like 2022 grad Darren Buchanan, who was not a transfer and is starting and averaging almost 16 points per game at George Washington here in D.C. And yeah, the big games are fun to watch. So, I don't know. But here's one thing I'm not at all conflicted about. A student on the school newspaper, the Jackson Reed Beacon, which I advise, who is absolutely crushing it. His name is Justin Glenn. He wrote a dozen stories about the basketball team and more about other sports before that, each one better than the last, including a tough piece last month about the school's football coach getting fired. So here's a shout out to Justin, the hardest working high school sports writer I've ever seen. A top college should recruit him too. We'll link to a couple of Justin's stories on the show page. You know, you really made a case for me to care about the fate of Jackson Reed stuff. And then as it went on, I was kind of like, ah, I don't know. You know, I, you know, I'm a person, I believe in uh, public schools and I believe in neighborhood schools and I wish everybody could go to a good, safe, well-funded neighborhood school. And this is the, the, the jock part coming up. So our neighborhood can play against your neighborhood, you know? And it's just, I don't know, man. You know, all the kids linking up. I I sound like what Charles Barkley and Shaq and Kenny Smith all rolled into one. But, you know, I just kind of wish, you know, kids in your neighborhood could play against the kids against this neighborhood. And, you know, we could have, you know, kind of shoot a fair one instead of all linking up and sucking up all the players and resources from the other public schools. But I guess if they have to go against well-moneyed private school, I guess you got to root for the public school, right? Well, Stefan, we also went to the Catholic League uh boys and girls finals here in DC, which is like the most storied or one of the most storied high school basketball leagues in the whole United States. And the team that's been dominating it on the boys side for the last few years is Paul the Sixth, 
um, which was ranked number two in the country behind Montverde, which is where like Cooper Flag is. And, you know, Paul VI has just some amazing, amazing players, including a guy who's going to Duke, a sophomore who's like, one of the most athletic basketball players I've ever seen in my life. And another kid that's going to Duke that sat the season out because he was injured. But the the fascinating thing there, Joel, is that Paul VI was like not anything. They're they're like not a thing until pretty recently. And so it kind of gets to your point about Jackson Reed and, you know, Sidwell, especially like Sidwell was never good at basketball until recently. Like so much of this is just like willful. Like if you as a school want to spend whether it's spending millions of dollars, whether it's recruit, whatever it is, you know, even in, in D.C. where schools like Gonzaga and DeMatha are so kind of legendary, it's possible to achieve it. It's just the question is, is it worth it? I mean, it's just as somebody who's not, I'm not from here. I just like enjoy the competition and enjoy basketball. It's like fun to watch these amazing players, but it's it's a very strange very competitive ecosystem, um, which is also fascinating, too, as an outside observer. My wife is always sort of fascinated by the idea that, like, whenever I talk about kids or athletes, I'm like, man, you just go out there and lose. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you just go to a school that's just not going to have a chance to win a championship. And I'm like, man, like, what is it like to just go out and play games and you know you're going to lose? And so I actually kind of feel like the kids that go to the other schools, the other public schools, they're the heroes of high school sports because they're providing the competition on the night. They don't have to do this. They're not going anywhere with this. It's just an experience for them. They're just having fun. So, you know, I mean, you know, the kids at Jackson Reed and DeMatha and Gonzaga, I mean, you know, they're they're getting their just deserved props. But, you know, sometimes we've got to send a little shout out to the guys that are just out there doing it, man you know, just in between homework. You know, the best high school basketball game I've attended in D.C. in the last few years, uh, apart from those crazy Sidwell Jackson Reed championship finals, was between two of the smaller schools. It was Walls against Ballou, and a bunch of kids that I know who were in my Scrabble club went to Walls. A couple of them were on the basketball team and went to this amazing game where one of my kids, Eliav Brooks Rubin, went off hit six threes, tiny gym, packed crowd, kids going crazy. <laughs> Not a ton of stakes here other than it was senior night and they were having fun and Eliav and his teammates had an evening that they'll never forget. It was awesome. Eliav now at Northwestern, not playing basketball, doing journalism. That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. Listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out. Go to slate.com slash hangup. You can email us at hangup at slate.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Joel Anderson and Stefan Fatsis, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zalmo Beatty, and thanks for listening. 